and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we're in the book of Exodus today. Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. You can study the entire Bible with me anytime you want to. All of the Bible, all 66 books, all 31,000 plus verses. Four times you can go through the Bible with me using my archives at thebibleversebyverse.com. All you have to do is choose, click, and listen. And all you need to bring is your Bible to thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus four twenty seven. And the Lord said to, to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. So Aaron hears from God while he was in Egypt. And God tells Aaron to go to Mount Sinai to meet his brother Moses, who he has not seen for 40 years. So after a few days' journey, Aaron arrives at the mountain where Moses had seen the burning bush and where he had talked with God. 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. So Moses fills Aaron in on all that God had commanded him to do. Aaron is now Moses' partner, so he needs to know all the details. Verse 29, And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. So Moses and Aaron go down to Egypt. When they get there, they call a meeting of all the heads of of all the tribes of Israel. 30. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. So the signs would include the staff of Moses turning into a serpent and then the other sign of his hand becoming a leprous and then returning to normal. So Moses did as God commanded him to do, and Aaron spoke everything that God told him to speak. 31, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. They were reminded of God's goodness. The people were, the Israelites were reminded of his goodness and of his concern, and they caused them to worship. After all that they had suffered as slaves in Egypt, at last something good is coming. And they're excited just to hear that God cares about them after all these years and will deliver them from their suffering. And from Egypt, that was a, a huge shot in the arm for them. Chapter 5. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now, Moses' knees may have been shaking, and his voice, we know, was probably cracking and stuttering, but Moses spoke the holy word of God, and he spoke it without apology. So Moses delivered the message of God that God told him to deliver, because what Moses had to say, since it was the pure word of God, was much more important than even the king of the world's superpower in that day. Verse 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. 
Pharaoh wants to know who the Lord is. Who's the Lord, he said. Well, after ten plagues, ten judgments, he will not be asking that question anymore. He will know who the Lord is. And Pharaoh says, I'm not going to let Israel go. Why should I? Three. And they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. In other words, Moses says, Pharaoh, if you don't let us obey our God and go three days journey into the wilderness to worship him, then he may plague us. You may end up losing your slaves anyway, was the message. Notice how they say, we pray thee. In other words, please. He's, they're being polite to Pharaoh. We have to be polite when we give out the word of God. That doesn't mean we can't be straightforward. That doesn't mean we can't be blunt. But we should be as polite as we possibly can. Verse 4. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, loose the people from their works? Get you unto your burdens. Some of the elders came to Pharaoh with Moses and with Aaron as they talked to him. And Pharaoh says, why are you all standing here? You should be working. Of course, if the slaves are not working, then Pharaoh is losing money. So he tells them to get back to work. He just completely disregarded the word of God that was given him. Get back to work. It's the only thing he has in mind. Five, and Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. Pharaoh had one thing in mind. And that one thing was money. Pharaoh did not want to hear about God and what he wants. Instead, all Pharaoh was concerned about was about all he was concerned about was that the slaves were not working and that he was losing money because of that. Verse 6. And Pharaoh commanded the same day, the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. The taskmasters were Egyptians and the officers were Israelites. And these are their orders from Pharaoh. Tell the people to go out and get their own straw for making bricks. Usually it was provided. Straw was mixed with the bricks to make the bricks um, stronger, hold together. And up until now, the Egyptians provided the straw for the Hebrews as they made the bricks. But now they have to go out and find their own straw too. So he just made it much more difficult on the slaves after been, being given the word of God, saying, release them. He went the opposite, and he takes it one step further. Further, Eight, and the number of the bricks which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish anything thereof, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Pharaoh didn't understand how anyone could want to go and worship the Lord. So he thought that the Israelites had an ulterior motive for wanting to take off work. They just wanted to be lazy. So he thought he thought it was because they were they they were lazy. So now after the meeting with Moses, Pharaoh makes them work twice as hard. Verse 9. Let their more let their more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. 
In other words, Pharaoh says, I'm going to make the Israelites work so hard that they will not have time to listen to lies about some so-called God setting them free or about them leaving their work to go worship that God of theirs. They're going to work so hard that that's the only, they're going to be too tired to even think about such things. That was what was in Pharaoh's mind. 10, and the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spoke to the people saying, thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. The slave drivers and their foremen went out to the places where they supervised the Israelites. And once they got there, they delivered to them the bad news about no more straw. You're gonna have to make the same amount of bricks, but you're not gonna get straw provided for you. You're gonna have to go out and get that too. 11, go ye, get you straw where ye can find it. Yet not any of your work shall be diminished. These taskmasters tell the Israelites to beg for it, to scrounge around for it, to get a nighttime job if need be, and then buy it, whatever. You better do it or you're going to be in trouble. And on top of that, the Israelites were then told that their productivity could not come down either. 12, so the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. What a miserable, terrible existence. They couldn't find regular straw, so they picked little stems that were stuck in the ground after crops were harvested. They used that. 13, and the taskmasters hastened them, saying, fulfill your works, your daily task, as when there was straw. The Israelites had already been working like dogs, but now the taskmasters were on their backs demanding more and more. They were told, do more and more, do it better, do it faster. 14, and the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick? both yesterday and today as heretofore. It was the job of the Hebrew supervisors to make sure that the slaves met their quota. And since the slaves were not meeting their quota, the supervisors were then beaten by the Egyptians. 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? The supervisors complained to Pharaoh and complaining directly to the king showed just how desperate they were. Most kings put their executioners, you know, the guy with the, with the black, with the black uh, bag over his head, the black mask. Usually, usually kings back in those days put that fellow in charge of their complaint department. But they were desperate, so they go and they complain directly to Pharaoh. And they continue in verse 16, there is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say unto us, make brick and behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. In other words, they're saying, King, your policy is flawed because you command us to do something that's impossible. And then you beat us when we can't do it. Fifth or 17, but he said, ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore, ye say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Pharaoh's command to make bricks without straw is foolish. And now he is accusing them of being lazy. Pharaoh thinks that he's showing them who is boss and that he's teaching them a real lesson. In reality, Pharaoh's only building up wrath for the day of God's wrath. 18, go therefore now and work for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the number of bricks. In other words, Pharaoh says, get back to work and don't bother me with any more complaints about this matter. 19, and the officers of the children of Israel did see 
that they were in evil case after it was said, ye shall not diminish anything from your bricks of your daily task. No justice, no mercy. And all that talk about being delivered by God, by Moses and Aaron, now that seems like a million miles away. And the Israelites saw, not only was their situation bad, but it was getting worse. Ever since Moses and Aaron showed up, it's gotten worse. 20, and they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. That was probably a bad place for them to stand. You know, those Hebrew supervisors just got chewed out by the king. And they were told that the new policies would not change, which meant more beatings. And when they came out of the palace, there stood Moses and Aaron, the two men that they hold responsible for their situation, being worse than it ever had been. 21, and they said unto them, the Lord look upon you and judge because ye have made us offensive in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. In other words, they say to Aaron and Moses, we hope the Lord punishes you for making the king hate us even more than he did before. And of course, Moses did the right thing. Moses was right to give them the word of God. And remember, they accepted the word of God with great joy too. But now, since they're suffering because of that word, they begin to complain. 22. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so badly treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? Moses has done everything that God told him to do. Moses said everything that God told him to say. So now Moses would like to call this mission off because he doesn't understand why things are, are getting worse instead of better. I've done everything right, but things aren't getting any better. They're getting worse. 23, for since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Moses is saying, Lord, I've kept my end of this deal. So I've done everything that you have told me to do, but you are falling short on your end, God. You know, Moses is talking as if God promised him smooth sailing all the way, but God did not promise that. In fact, God promised Moses that Pharaoh wouldn't accept it and that it would take several judgments against Pharaoh before he'd finally cough up the Israelites. So I don't know why Moses is so upset. It's so easy to gloss over the word of God, the parts of God's word that seem to be unpleasant, that are unpleasant. We don't want to hear them. We don't want to talk about them. We don't want to study them. Preachers don't want to preach them. So they pass over them. And then the Christians or whoever who they speak to are absolutely shocked when all the bad stuff comes to pass. And they're shocked because they were not warned. And they were not warned because they had false teachers who wouldn't do their job because they wanted to be popular. Here, Pharaoh did his, I mean, Moses did everything that he was supposed to do. He said everything that he had to say. But he forgot what the word of God said, evidently, or he ignored it, that there would be trouble as a result of the word. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. As I mentioned last time, all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, said the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be shocked when you live for him and you do the right thing and you find yourself ostracized, in trouble, loss of job, loss of money, loss of family, loss of friends. What are you shocked about? Why is Moses shocked? I don't know. He didn't pay attention to the word of God. I warned him ahead of time. It's part of the deal. You get forgiveness, you get eternal life, life, you get a resurrected body on a brand new earth, and you also get a whole lot of trouble for living for Jesus in this world. That's just part of the deal. Take it or leave it. You want to quit? Quit. But remember the words of Peter. Where will we go, Lord? You're the one who have the, has the words of eternal life. 
If you would like to be a part of this ministry that does not water down the Word of God, that has been given it out straight ever since I began it 35 years ago, if you would like to be a part of this ministry and help me teach the whole counsel of God, then pray for me and pray for God's Word and click the donate button at the top of the front page at the thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.